Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you from K-State Online as we get set for K-State and KU, the Sunflower Showdown. No corporate sponsors in my books unless, you know, uh, a grocery store chain that originated in my hometown of Hutchinson, Kansas wants to fork over the cash for it. But the Cats and the Jayhawks, they get ready to square off yet again in football it is, uh, well, it's always been a fun time in my lifetime when K-State and KU have played each other uh, in this sport. I've I've not really known any pain. The only painful years are when Ron Prince was the head coach, and those don't even count because Ron Prince was the head coach. So as these teams get ready to square off for what I believe is the 121st time on Saturday, what is the first thing that comes to mind when thinking about this matchup for you, Derek? Uh, the dominance over the last decade and a half. I mean, you don't see too many rivalries be this one-sided uh, for that extended of amount of time. You, it really is unheard of. It's pretty rare. Even in the cycles that that I was kind of, you know, submerged in the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry where Michigan dominated for like the first part of my childhood and then Ohio State went on, you know, the, like a two-decade run. Most of those contests are at least close. Like, in this streak by Kansas State, only a couple are remotely close, right? I mean, I think you go back to Bill Snyder's final season where they only beat Kansas 21 to 17. That's the only close one in my childhood or childhood. Your childhood my, time, yeah. <laughs> my time covering the Wildcats. And there's probably not many others that are similar to that. And that was because, you know, things that started to get a little sideways on Bill Snyder at that point in time. He's, you know, removed, um, resigns, retires, th- does his thing. And as soon as Chris Clyden steps in, they go back to Clubber in Kansas State. I mean, there's a 55-14 to 14, uh, win thrown in there. So, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is just the dominance. But also, I will say this, also the resurgence of Kansas because Lance Leipold has made this a more than respectable program. And he's done it pretty quick. I think that's uh, one of the things that stands out to me is that – He's not only has this thing happened, but it's gone at a pretty rapid pace. And I, you know, the three, yeah. yeah, I mean, K State, you, you look at it last year, they still win by 20 points, but that game felt closer and like K State had to execute at a better level than what they had in the past. And you just look at where KU was. I mean, they were at the bottom of the barrel of college football, and he's been able to get them ascended very, very quickly. And a lot of it has to do with just how good of a coach he is. And obviously, he's acquired good talent within his coaching staff that has set them up. Uh, he had some good foundational pieces there when he showed up and has added to it. So he is he is a legit guy, and he is on his way to making this a legitimate competition between these two sides again because you go through and look. I mean, you mentioned 2018. That was a four-point K-State win. But in this streak that – <laughs> yeah, exactly. That and this streak that has started. So K State's won 14 in a row. There have only been two games that have been decided by single digits, and it was 2009 and 2018. Everything else, K State has had blowout wins. Uh, the next closest they won 30 to 20 in 2017 wasn't the most appealing of games there. But like you said, Chris Kleiman has helped dominate this rivalry since he came in, and it feels like that he understands the emphasis and the focus that goes into this game. And that's a really important and impactful thing, uh, I, I believe, to K-State fans is that, you know, I think some guys come into jobs and they will downplay the importance of one singular game and, and a rivalry and everything else. I think Chris Kleiman, he's not going to do it overboard, but he's still going to make sure that this team is ready to play against KU and it's they don't just turn into any other game because it's not any other game to your fan base. And at the end of the day, that's what college sports is all about and what really matters here is – the reason why these guys are playing college football is because there's a fan base that wants it and supports it, and so you have to cater to them, and that's what Chris Kleiman has done since coming to K-State by torching KU. Yeah, I mean, retaining and continuing you know, the tradition of signing some of the best players in the state of Kansas, that has helped. So you could tell he really understands it because he's doing that. Um, Kansas State always signed a bunch of players from Kansas. Under Chris Kleiman, that has been sustained 
but they're also getting some of the better players from Kansas that maybe they weren't before. So he's even enhanced it a little bit. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention three guys that he initially retained. Only two are still here that I think helped foster that process along a little bit. Obviously, Taylor Bratt, uh, he lives, breathes this rivalry, the Sunflower Showdown. Like he, he calls it the worst week of his life every year because of how much it means to him. So that that's important, Colin Klein, because he's been at Kansas State long enough. He gets it now. Mm-hmm. And don't forget, obviously he wasn't here long with, with Chris Kleiman, but he did retain Blake Seiler as well. So uh, three guys that really understood it and could help, you know, push that down the road and, and continue – to have that train rolling in that direction. But Lance Leipold deserves a lot of credit for what he has done. You know, we get a lot of crap for, you know, people from Lawrence or, you know, you know whatever it may be about, you know, everyone always wants Lance, talks about Lance Leipold leaving. And that's because of how much respect there is for Lance Leipold. You ask any K-State fan at this point or any K-State media member at this point, they know that Lance Leipold is a brilliant coach. So it's not about having a lack of disrespect. It's a, it's about having respect and knowing that Kansas State's not going to be able to dominate this rivalry in the fashion that they have for 14 years because of Lance Leipold. So the you know people wanting him to leave, that's a sign of how good of a coach he is because as long as he stays, and I, and I think he probably will at this point, he's going to get some wins over K-State, and that's going to be hard to stomach. Yeah, I mean, it, it hasn't even happened yet, and I'm already not enjoying that that talk and that conversation. It's and I, I I said this uh, on the Wednesday show with Drew and, and kind of discussing it and everything, but this is one of those deals where, uh, you know, I I've, I've talked to guys that aren't K State fans or whatever else, and they they're like, you know, aren't you being a little bit dramatic about like what your reaction will be when K State actually loses the KU again? And I said. I mean, yeah, probably like you would think I've got other things in life that are like important, I guess, like my wife and my kid and, you know, being alive and being healthy and all that. But also the last time K-State lost to KU in my life, I was 10 years old. So the only emotions in my body that I have where I like know how to handle K-State losing to KU I am a 10-year-old. I, I have 10-year-old emotions in me. That's how I know how to handle losing to KU in football. So I don't think it will be that easy to, to get over, and people are going to melt down about it. I mean, people already melt down about every other K-State loss, so why would this one be different? But this one has an elevated level of meltdown to it. So it is That's- a big deal, and it, it, you're right. It will happen. As long as Lance Leipold stays at KU for the long term, he is going to get a win over K-State. I am I am almost confident in saying that, and that is no fault of Chris Kleiman and this staff or anything else. It is just the fact of life that if you get a good coach and he gets enough chances against one team that obviously KU will continue to put elevated emphasis on inside their program, then it's going to happen. You will make that happen at some point. So I think that's the one good thing. I mean, this is only the second ranked matchup all time in the Sunflower Showdown. Uh, that is a significant deal. That's one of those things that helps. Like, look, I I enjoy K State kicking the shit out of KU. Like, I'm I, I'm going to be dead honest about that. And if you can guarantee the next hundred of them, it wasn't even within thirty points. I'm okay with that. And I don't want to hear it from the people like, well, don't you wish it was just a game? No, I do enjoy K State beating the heck out of KU. That's totally fine with me. But overall, it's good for both of these schools. It's good for the state. It's good for the conference. It's good for a lot of reasons that these two teams are now both on a close to the same competitive level. And it's probably only going to continue to grow because I think a lot of people are saying it right now. So I don't feel biased in saying it, but the two best coaches in the big 12 at this point in time reside in the state of Kansas. It is definitely Chris Kleiman and Lance Leipold, the way things are going. Those two, you, you might roll your eyes a little bit about this. Uh, Mike Gundy. I knew you were going to say Mike Gundy. That's, that's fine. He's a has been DY. We thought so. <laughs> and I so, think so again. Can't no, lose the UCF like that. <laughs> Mike Gundy deserves to be right there, I would say. But you're right. The, the two best coaches in the Big 12 are probably these guys. And you wouldn't have a lot of people disagree with you. I had two things, and I hope I remember 
what those two things were that I was going to say. One being you do have to have a little bit of perspective because I think some of the, you know, premeditated meltdown should KU hmm. finally beat K-State is a failure to accept that this is a better KU team. And even the general public won't be critical of K-State or anyone else for losing to a team like Kansas anymore because it's not like you're losing to the laughing stock of Power 5 football. Oklahoma lost to them this year. Texas lost to them a couple years ago. So it's just Texas lost to them before it was acceptable to lose to KU. <laughs> they did. That that was the Jared Casey Applebee's yeah. moment. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And and there was a, one more thing I wanted to say. This is not really good for the show and I'm trying to remember that what that was and I'm actually failing to re- recall. That happens. But, yeah, it happens. So we'll see. Um just I think Kansas State's going to win, but just remember, Kansas is good. Yeah, you know, I guess that's I don't I don't like that. Again, I, I would much rather this just not be a thing, but it is, and it, it's it, it oh. is good for both sides and the anticipation of it and everything else that goes into it. But yeah, it's I uh, did remember what I was going to say, and this is why this becomes pretty important. Kansas State's almost a double-digit fa- favorite at this point over KU. If they are to beat Kansas again, and it would be 15 straight if they did, I believe, mm-hmm. Kansas has to go to Manhattan next year. That becomes – and probably, you know, they're going to have a good team, assuming Jail Daniels is the quarterback and maybe Devin Neal comes back. They're going to be – and Lance Leipold's the coach. They're going to be good, but it's a lot harder to win on the road. You wouldn't think that they would break the streak on the road. So – if they lose this, then you feel like you're you're another two years away if you're the Jayhawks. Okay, well we're ending we're we're ending that segment on a positive note then I guess so that's that's a good thing for everybody to to go out into the the world with. So uh, and to be honest, that. it was Steve Weber that that explained it to me that way, which it, it's kind of true. Like a road win in in a tight rivalry like this sometimes is good for two wins. Yeah, no, you're 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 absolutely right about that. There's there's no doubt about it. All right. Well, rolling on here, thinking about what we've what we've got in front of us to see K State go out and do against Kansas this weekend. Uh, what stands out to you about the way K State is playing right now, and and what level are they at? Because I think the the one big thing to address is that there are probably a lot of people that are looking at how K State has played on the road this year and translating that into what's going to happen against KU. But how much can you take from K State's road appearances at Missouri? at Oklahoma State, at Texas Tech, and at Texas, and translate it into what's going to happen in Lawrence? It's not about the road. It's about who they're playing when they play good teams because they still stomp Texas Tech at the end of the day on the road. So it's it's about playing some of those better teams because the home slate has been much more navigable. You you play any of those games on the road that you got at home, you're still probably winning pretty convincingly. So it's – you know, when you play tougher competition, the games are going to be tighter. Now they need to – they're making plays, but they need to get the play because you're a play short against Missouri when you had a chance to extend the lead to two possessions late in the fourth quarter. You're a play short against Texas when you have the ball fourth, you know, first and goal at the four or five-yard line. And then you, slow starter against Oklahoma State, you lose by eight, but you still have an opportunity there to tie the game. So you're a play short. You need to make the play, not just – some plays, and and I think that's what it comes down to in, in some of these tight games. I understand the consternation, though, because Kansas State hasn't won a close game yet this year, and most will believe that this is going to be a close game. Yeah, no, that, that's I think that's the thing, that there's a lot of that. I mean, you look around, and this is a situation where – K State's playing a team in KU that they are they are good. They are a top half of the Big 12 type team, and the only you know evidence – uh, earlier in this year, K State has struggled in those games, so we'll see. But I think you, it, it's it, the way I kind of sum this up. Like Oklahoma State's the only real stinker. Did K State do things against Missouri and Texas that they they probably could have avoided or been better at and not lost that game? Yes, but at the end of the day, you lost by a field goal at the number nine team in the country and the number seven team in the country. And I know both games were kind of odd and, and had their different things about them, but that's just a fact the Oklahoma state game was a straight up stinker. That game could have been played against anybody else. It, I mean, 
it's not that Oklahoma State was the reason why K-State sucked in that game. It was that K-State sucked in that game and they're at fault for it. They could have done that against Houston this year and maybe still won against Houston. They could have done that against Baylor this year and maybe still beaten Baylor. Instead, they did it against Oklahoma State, and unfortunately, the Cowboys were up to the snuff that that night and really for the entirety of the season and uh, were able to pull out the win. So I don't know that you can take a ton from what K-State's done on the road this season and translate it to this game. However, you will have to deal with a really good crowd on Saturday night. I mean, I, I have said this all season long, but I that game that I went to in September to watch KU beat Illinois – I was very impressed for what the crowd was on a Friday night, so I can't imagine Saturday night, nothing going on, 6 o'clock late in the season against your rival. That place is going to be packed. I'm sure it's going to be an awesome environment. K-State will have to deal with that. Fortunately, the the environment in Columbia was very good. They obviously dealt with a pretty rowdy crowd in Stillwater. Um, I don't know, you know, the Texas crowd, it, it's always big, but, you know, how how much does that actually impact the game? Um, but it's it's a significant deal, and and they'll be ready for it, I would think, based on how everything else has gone. So w- we'll see. I, I just I I'm with you. I don't know that you can translate too much from prior road games this season and put it on what's going to happen in this game against KU. What I will say is, K State lost to the really good teams on our schedule: Oklahoma State, Texas, Missouri, and they beat a lot of the bad, all the bad ones or below average teams. KU and then Iowa State, even after that are those first teams that K-State's really going to play that are kind of like on that second team. They're, they're yeah. not good. They're, they're not great like Texas, but they're not bad like Baylor. They're, I guess maybe Oklahoma State's in that tier as well. But KU and Iowa State, K-State's lost to the good teams, killed the bad teams. KU and Iowa State's in a little bit between where you beat any of those two teams and hopefully both. It's your best one of the year. Yeah, that that's a good point too. It's not just it's just not about where the games have been. It's just in general you think about how it's gone down. Like K State has played pretty well defined good teams and pretty well defined bad teams this year. And the the teams kind of in the the middle ground right now. It's it's taken a while to actually get to the point where we're going to see K State score off against them. So uh, it, it will be interesting to see what it looks like against Kansas, and then obviously the follow up. Uh, next week against Iowa State. All right. The Thinking best, about the best wins ahead. against Texas Tech right now. Uh, I think the best win right now is against Troy. I, I think that's where K State's at. Uh, obviously, in conference play, it's probably Texas Tech. But yeah, I think if you look at it, Troy Troy might be on paper the best team that K State's beaten this season. I the the schedule has not been uh, that impressive or that exciting for K State this year. That is uh, for darn sure. So. I don't know. I, it's just one of those weird years in the Big 12, the way things have uh, ended up working out and how uh, K-State's having to kind of deal with it is, you know, the, interesting to say the least. So, All right, looking at things that work for K-State in this game. There was already a little concern about the road stuff. What, what struggles, what doesn't work there? But what will work for K-State in this game against KU that you are confident is going to happen uh, once we've seen the 60 minutes play out on Saturday? Should be running the ball, right? Like, we've seen KU really struggle to defend the run. They're a little bit better in that regard. Um, But in general, their defense is still lacking quite a bit, even if they did take steps forward this year, because they're still – they're getting some stops, more so than in the past, but not a lot of stops. And the times that they're, you know, kind of coming out on the winning sides because they're forcing turnovers and – even sometimes scoring off of those turnovers. So uh, you got to take care of the ball, and you should probably be able to run the ball as well. KU, I'll give them credit here. They got a lot of veterans in the secondary that have played a lot of football. You got to think Kenny Logan, Kobe Bryant, those guys have played a lot of football. They played a lot of Sunflower Showdowns. Run defense, not as apt. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I mean, you would think that it should be the run defense that sticks out. Uh, the only issue is, is I mean, and this was a little different because the game dictated it differently, but we thought that K-State would run it all over the place on Baylor last week, and that's just not what ended up happening. But like I said, the, the game kind of played out in a different manner, and it worked out. And K-State still was good on the ground. DJ Giddens had a really good game for K-State, so I wouldn't necessarily – 
overreact to K-State not running the ball like crazy last week. But I expect a big game in the run running attack by K-State. I just think that it's it's something that uh, even when KU has had, you know, better numbers this year and, and on paper, I think people see that they're improved. Uh, you know, I hate to go back to this, and I think sometimes uh, everybody does this, and I'm very guilty of it. We'll put more stock into, like, what what we've actually seen. It's why during the NCAA tournament, I always pick a ton of Big 12 teams to go further than anybody else because I've seen more Big 12 basketball, so I know more about it. But from what I saw in person, like, Illinois didn't have impressive running numbers per se against KU this year. There were still holes for them. They they abandoned the run too early, and they still had their moments where they bust through and had some big ones. Like this KU run run defense is susceptible. And K State obviously has two running backs that can do it. They have a quarterback in Will Howard that if you give him the right situation, he'll pop off and do it for you. And then they also have the wrinkle of Avery Johnson. So I guess in turn with that, because this is a question that has to be asked every week. How much would you anticipate Avery Johnson plays on Saturday? Not factoring in that, you know, if this game is like Sunflower Showdowns of the past where K-State's up by three touchdowns with five minutes left. I'm not saying it will be an identical plan. At least I would hope not because I, I don't think I really enjoyed it. But in terms of usage, like quantity-wise, <coughs> excuse me, I could see it reflect the Missouri game a little bit because yeah. I don't think you need, you should be getting a bunch of him with the way that Will Howard is playing. But I think enough because he can be a weapon and a nice change of pace against KU in a very meaningful game. Okay, I was I was worried you were going to say the TCU game there. I was like, eh, you know, I, I like Avery Johnson just as much as everybody else, but I, I don't know that the TCU game split is uh, what we're looking for here. So that's good to hear. That's good to hear that you, that you went that way uh, instead of one of the, the other routes that it could have gone down. So. That uh, makes sense to me. Well, if, it, if it's anything like TCU or Texas Tech, it's, I don't know that that's a good thing for K State because it means Will Howard ran into some problems. Yeah, that's 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 a good way of putting that. I I would agree with that. Uh, defensively for K State, I mean, what do you see with KU offensively that K State might be able to exploit or at least have some level of success with uh, when when they they face off. Well, K-State's been forcing a lot of turnovers lately. It's really where they've turned the corner um, as a team is turnover margin. I think even if Jason Bean plays, that's a guy that has a propensity, especially mm -hmm. late in games, to, to give it up. And Kansas State's been opportunistic as well. I think the turnover margin is going to play a significant role on Saturday. So that's an area where I would look um, in terms of what I would be worried about. Look, I have a lot of respect for Devin Neal. I think he's a hell of a player. I think KU should get him the ball a lot more than they do instead of this 50-50 timeshare that they do with Daniel Hyshaw. And with Jake Clifton out, um, the KU scheme playing with your eyes as much as it does, I do wonder if they can, you know, get Austin Remain or, or, you know, some other players, but mainly Remain since he's a true freshman, out of place and maybe get some rushing explosives because Devin Neal is certainly capable of doing that. Yeah, I mean, Devin Neal and Daniel Hyshaw are the two things that are the most concerning at this point in time about the KU offense, given the uncertainty at quarterback because of injury for KU. And then also, I mean, they had some guys get banged up in the receiving game. And Bean uh, can run, too. So. Yeah, and, and Bean can run. Uh, no JD, no problem. Jason Bean, first play of the game against Texas, um, a wise man once said. Um, but – Thinking about those guys and, and how they operate, I mean, K-State has faced some great running backs in the Big 12 this year already. Uh, despite the fact that they face very few good teams, they have faced some good running backs, Ollie Gordon being one of them, Jonathan Brooks, uh, another Taj Brooks was another one as well. Uh, and K-State's been good against them. And even you think about the guys that they face in the non-con, both Troy and Missouri have great running backs that are towards the top of the country and rushing. K-State has been able to basically do the best against opposing running backs than the rest of the field this year. So uh, what does that matchup look like for you in the case of K-State's defense against the running backs of Highshaw and Neal? I just worry a little bit without Clifton. And you put a true freshman in there against a scheme that really plays with your eye discipline. So I'm just, to be honest, I am a little concerned about that. Yeah, and you know, I Baylor, it, ultimately the numbers didn't end up looking crazy impressive. But Baylor had some some moments where they popped off against K-State last week. And I think 
some of that had to do a little bit with not knowing what to expect in, in, in certain moments and situations, but there is a little bit of a, an uncertainty. And we know that K-State has struggled with the, the big play moments that they've allowed to teams this season in the passing game. And so that's something to watch out because KU has the weapons to make you pay at that position. And not only is it that you're, you're worrying about being without Jake Clifton now, but I think about the, the situation that K-State is in with guys up front. And in that Texas game, it felt like they got the contact early on Jonathan Brooks, but they didn't actually have the power and the ability to finish the tackle. And he always broke through and got, you know, three, four or more yards. And each run was six yards, it seemed like, when it maybe should have been held to two. And we talked a lot about the defensive tackles at the start of the season and how, you know, kind of surprising and good they had been. Well, now they've gotten banged up. Damian Elalio has, has missed time. And I think that we've seen a little bit of a, I don't know, a, a downtick in the way that those guys have performed. And they're going to have to be a big part of what happens up front. Obviously, the linebackers have to come through, and you already talked about how tough of a situation it is for those guys without Jake Clifton. They've been without Daniel Green for a long time. So, that, that I mean, that is the most concerning thing, but I also put some of this up on that defensive line up front, and they're going to have to, to more than do their share this week to help contain KU's run game. And the KU offensive line has improved. Yes, that is true. That is true as well. I mean, really, you look around in general, like KU has improved in a lot of different spots, even from last year's team that before things started to snowball, they were playing really well. And uh, they this is a legit team that K-State is going on the road to face. That Again, at the end of the day, you break it down. K-State should still probably win this game, but it is something to monitor, and you are facing a good team, so you have to be ready for about anything else that uh, ends up coming your way. All right, rolling on here. Let's dive into uh, our best bets now. Take a break from the Sunflower Showdown action, everything else. Here is a look at how things played out last week. Uh, Ollie Gordon did not go over 144 and a half rushing yards. I'm not sure Oklahoma State is a team total 144 rushing yards, but Missouri and K-State did come through for me. The Mizzou thing, I mean, Tennessee is a fraud. I got no idea what's going on there, so I don't know why people thought that Mizzou wouldn't win a home game against them. Uh, and D.Y. is flashing up his 3-0. and uh, That happened fairly easily. I mean, K-State got out to a giant lead in the in the, the first half. And in the second half, they did just enough to, to get it done. UCF blew past 30 and a half in Colorado. They are covering no, monsters this, uh, this time of year under Deion Sanders. They almost won. Yeah, no, that's true. They did. I need to go look to see. Colorado's got to be like eight and two against the spread this year. Stanford's pretty good against it too. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Let's okay. Uh, let's see here real quick. Colorado this season. This is just for anybody that's interested. They play Washington State tomorrow night in Pullman. Washington State four point favorites. Going not my into this game. Not a best bet of mine, but I did bet Colorado money line in general. I think the bus can win that. Mm, okay. All right. Well, uh, Colorado's plus 160. Washington line. State hasn't done anything in like a month, two months. No, you're right. I mean, we had a conversation at the start of the year where I said, when Oregon State and Washington State played each other, I, and I took Oregon State, I said, they're a real good team. Washington State is a fake good team. And Washington State won. And now and it was like, oh, man, okay, well, they, they might be the real deal and everything. Uh, they're not. They were frauds like I anticipated. They just decided to screw me later on and, and make me get upset about it. But uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's not a bad one to, to think out there. I'm having a tough time finding uh, Colorado and what they are against the spread. I thought I was going to have an easier time doing it, but uh, okay. They're actually only 6-3-1 and one now that I see it, which kind of surprises me. Still good, though. Yeah, no, not bad at all, but you know, a little bit of a shock. It's they had part. that stretch where they struggled, though. Uh, they they lost that game to Stanford, and they lost to Arizona, or they they beat Arizona State, but they were uh, they were minus three there. That's where the tie Colorado came State from. game, yeah, Colorado, Colorado State. State and Oregon. Uh, they had a tough time covering that Oregon game, but it is so, what it is. I will. I yeah, no, you got it. All right, here we go. This is this week's lineup. Uh, looky there. Uh, good Big 12 action for you. Somebody's got to have a Big 10 team. D.Y. going with Illinois. Uh, I'll, I'll let you go first. Explain yourself first on uh, your three picks this week. Well, Iowa lost Cooper to Gene. Um, 
who I think is the reason why they cover almost by himself, just yeah. because of how much of a weapon he is on special teams and defense. And, you know, they got their big win last week, scored 22 points. So uh, I, I think now you get some regression again because you scored so many points last week. Illinois is not very good, but they've hung around with just sure. about every Big Ten West team. And Illinois, despite everything that's gone on in their season, because, you know, I am an honorary fighting Illini now, given my ties to Alec Bussey, RIP, um, not dead. Not dead. Not dead. No, very much alive. Going to see him in a week uh, when 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 Iowa State comes to, to Manhattan. But uh, watching him, we're watching them. I think I'm a bigger Illinois football fan than he is. So I've been on top of it. And I was sitting and texting like, man, I can't. I was like, I can't believe we're we're a game away from going bowling again this year. It's a big deal. Uh, Illinois finishes with Iowa this weekend on the road, and then at home against Northwestern. Uh, so there is the there is the motivation factor there. Illinois could get a surprising win, steal their bowl eligibility just right now. And my Texas Tech bet is just fading UCF after last week. Yeah, probably smart. It's a low enough number too that if you think Tech's going to win the game, they can probably get that bowl. number. They're playing yeah. for a bowl. It is the then, it was the eligible. Yeah. And then at Sunflower Showdown, KUK State. If anyone's leading at any point more than 17 points, I would be surprised. But I said that I think when the number was 14 and a half at Texas Tech, and we both got that wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because I actually bet it after uh, after you you threw it out there. It's like, I like that. I really do like that. And then at the end, you know, we're driving back, and I'm like, well, actually, I think that one worked out for me. I was like, oh, no, because K-State just kicked their ass in the second half. I didn't really anticipate that happening. So, yeah, you know, so. That, was a, that was a good thing, despite the, the money that was lost on it. Uh, I mean, would, right. you, would you be shocked if someone had an 18-point or greater lead? I don't know that I would be shocked, but I'm not anticipating it. Like, there's, there, I'm not thinking that that's going to happen, uh, but – I don't even necessarily know that I would have thought it about last year's game in case they ended up winning the game by 20 uh, and it didn't even feel like it. So there is a world where it happens and, and I can see it, especially given, you know, the last 15 years, but on paper, I would not expect the lead to get over 17. I think you're probably right on that. All right. Well, uh, same way that you're fading UCF after a giant win, the Cincinnati Bearcats finally won a big 12 game last week and on the road at Houston, and now they have to go to Morgantown and face West Virginia. I'm taking the Mountaineers minus six and a half. Uh, West Virginia got their butt kicked in Norman last weekend. They get back home, and they're trying. Honestly, West Virginia should win seven, eight games this season, uh, given what's left on their schedule. I think they beat Cincinnati, and I don't think Cincinnati's very good. Maybe West Virginia is the type of team that Cincinnati can muck it up with and keep it close because they've done that in a handful of games this year. But I'm taking the Mountaineers minus six and a half. And then uh, I'm going to go back to the SEC and also victimize Tennessee one more time. I know the game is in is in Neyland Stadium, but Georgia minus 10 and a half. Tennessee doesn't have any offense to speak of this season. I get it's a road game, whatever, Knoxville, blah, blah, blah. Georgia, even though they're not as good as they've been in past years, they're still really good. So I'm taking the Bulldogs minus 10 and a half. I will say I had... I had considered Missouri minus 10 and a half at home against Florida as well. I am coming around to really enjoying betting on Missouri because I think that the SEC, uh, they're, they're, people are in the, the sports betting world are not respecting uh, Missouri like they should at this point in time. I'm, I'm fading Missouri this week. Doesn't feel like a good spot for them. Okay. Well, I'm glad I didn't put them up there then. Uh, and then my K State KU pick, I'm taking the Cats minus two and a half in Hot the fourth quarter. Hot start. I like it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it happens. I think uh, I, I I have a tough time seeing KU with the lead after the first quarter. I think that would set people into a real panic and a tizzy. So it's probably just best to avoid that and uh, make sure that it doesn't happen. So those are the best bets for the week, and uh, that's how things look. All right, moving on. Let's get into the game MVPs. If K-State is to win on Saturday night in Lawrence, who is the shining star offensively and defensively for the Wildcats? Uh, let's think about the Kansas guys. I like DJ Giddens on offense. Like I said, Kansas State should be able to run the ball. And it's usually DJ Giddens when Will Howard is the main quarterback um, rather than Trayshawn Ward. So I, I think DJ Giddens. 
Although you, you could make a strong argument for the offensive line if, if they just take control of the line of scrimmage. Defensively, I don't know if star's the right word, but they need Austin Remain to be good. Well, I mean, that's 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 true. That's a good point. Uh, they need somebody in the linebacking unit that we don't anticipate to have a good game, or they need Des Purnell and Austin Moore to just play out of their minds and make up for the deficiencies that are going to be there from not having Jake Clifton. Um, those are not bad picks at all. I mean, I, I talked about the guys up front, the defensive line. Uh, I think I'm going to – did I did I say Khalid Duke last week? Uh, yes. Or maybe I, – I feel like I say I Khalid think, Duke I or Marquis Stegall Khalid, a lot. I think you say Khalid Duke every week. <laughs> I mention him a lot. Hey, I'm going to say him again because guess what? I'm not going to say one of the, the nose guards because, you know, whatever. I don't want to have to pick one of them. Th- those two guys need to be good. But – no matter who's back there at quarterback, when they go back to throw, you have to try and get pressure on them because either a true freshman walk-on is going to make mistakes or Jason Bean, who is a I don't know what year, he is going to make mistakes too if you put him in pressurized situations. Do it, especially if you're Khalid Duke, because you're getting a second chance on life after not getting suspended for uh, punching the daylights out of the Baylor player last week. So Khalid Duke, You've got you've got kind of this little second wind here. Take advantage of it. Go out and uh, dominate against KU. So I, I'm going with Khalid Duke defensively. Offensively, this was you know peeking ahead to our over under totals. One of the questions was about uh, yards per attempt on the passing game for K State. Uh, Drew said it. I think over eight is what the number is essentially, and. I took the over. While I think that the 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 run game is the main focus and the star of the show, I'm going with Will Howard in this spot because there will be the opportunity for him to break off, I think, some significant runs that K-State can scheme up there. But I think that when K-State does throw in this game, the, the opportunity will be there for some big chunks because they're going to try and pound it so much. That's kind of been the thing in, in past years against KU, I think. I at least have memories of the 2019 game, the first one that Kleiman coached in in Lawrence, where K-State did a lot of running the ball in that game. But when Skylar Thompson did throw it, he made some big throws down the field. I think he opened the second half with a big throw to Dalton Schoen. And I think that's what happens in this game, where K-State gets a lot of big chunks through the air when they actually go to it, whether it's to a receiver or Ben Sennett or whoever. So I am taking K-State. Uh, in, in that situation with the over, obviously, and Will Howard has to shine in that spot as a passer. And uh, no matter what happens the rest of the way with the Will Howard career and everything, you know, I know that's been a hot topic for some people lately. You have to go out there and uh, your legacy can be cemented and defined if you can just take care of business against KU one more time. So put the gas down, throttle them, and let's go from there. Uh, I mean, I, I maybe maybe you disagree with that. Maybe you don't think Will Howard's going to be as big of a star in this game as I, I think he will be or want him to be. No, I can say it. Do you think he gets the single-season record? Oof. I mean, he's got to get four in this game. I don't think so. I think K-State will pound it uh, on the ground when they're down there this week. I Now, there will be some situations where they throw, but I think they'll work the run game a little bit more. I got gotcha. you. Sorry. I'm also watching the Kansas State women's basketball game, for those that don't know. Well, you know, the Cats just trying to the, okay. assert their dominance as the, the best the best women's team in the Midwest, not not this Iowa Bowl stuff. Uh, all I'll, right. I have trouble hurting right now. Uh, well, what what do you know? Refs always have to get K-State in big games, get, getting key players in foul trouble. Think about the refs Yoki, against FAU think, last year. I think Yoki's got two. I think that's why she's not on the floor right now. Well, uh, I – uh, that's not good to hear. Not good to hear. All right. Uh, this will this game will be done by the time that you hear this podcast. So yeah. uh, you're probably like, oh, yeah, trust me. I know. I, I saw what happened. Okay. Uh, in terms of predictions for how the game plays out and a final score, uh, let me know what you think on this one, D.Y. In terms of game script, how it unfolds, I, I don't really know. I think Kansas State holds a lead throughout, but I think it's a narrow one. So my final score that I've been sharing that I haven't waffled from this week, though I did last week, is 31-24 Kansas State. Mm, okay, so a touchdown game. That would be uh, a tidy, only the third in this stretch. I hope I'm wrong. 
Yeah, I hope you're wrong, too. I hope it's even bigger than that. Uh, I'm taking K-State 37-24. I'm kind of in the same boat as you. I think that there will be some back and forth to it, but it it will be a lot like last year's game, just a little bit tighter, where K-State has this thing at an arm's length, but it's like a 11-year-old arm's length. It's not like a full-grown adult arm's length. You know, we're not talking LeBron James wingspan. We're talking, you know, Mason Voth wingspan at the age of 11. So I'm going to I'm going to say that K-State wins at 37-24. I think it's going to be key that K-State gets the jump early. You can't make mistakes. I mean, I, I wrote about it this week for question of the week, but the turnover battle is such a key in this game. And it's not just about the the overall margin. It is what you do with the turnovers and avoiding the disastrous one. KU is really good at capitalizing on that. As long as K-State does it, I think they strike first. I think they can get it to the point where you're, we're probably looking at a two-score game most of the way. KU cutting it to a score at various points. And, you know, maybe they get a stop and get the ball. And we're looking at the K-State defense having to rise up and make a stand. I think this will be played as a close game. The final score may not indicate it. So I'm taking K-State 37-24. Uh, and that is where I, I stand on this matter. So there you go. That's your Sunflower Showdown preview. I hope you're more correct than I am. Me too. Uh, real quick, before we get out of here, here is a look at the Big 12 scoreboard this weekend. Other games in the league, 11 a.m., 10 a.m. Mountain Time. BYU is hosting Oklahoma. I got that flipped around on there. That's that's my bad, folks. Uh, but that game is in Provo, so Oklahoma on the road. Cincinnati and West Virginia at 1.30 on ESPN+, Plus, where that game belongs. Also on ESPN+, Plus this weekend, Baylor, their fifth straight ESPN+, Plus game, their seventh of the season. They are on the road at TCU in the uh, Blue Bonnet, whatever they're calling it. People were dunking on the trophy and everything else. Uh, I, it, don't watch that game. I, I'm telling you, do not watch that game, folks. 3 o'clock, Oklahoma State and Houston on ESPN2. Cats desperately need Houston to pull out a win here. And same for BYU, given the uh, update to the tiebreaker situation. UCF at Texas Tech, winner gets the six wins in a bowl game at four on FS2. And then K-State, KU in a ranked-on-ranked matchup. And then Texas at Iowa State, that game is not at 9-15. I can assure you of that. Uh, it's at 7 o'clock on Fox. So that is a big one. In Ames, I tell you what, that is a uh, – a, a little bit of a tricky spot for Texas, especially now that we know that Jonathan Brooks is done for the season, and so they lose their their biggest threat offensively in that game. It'll be interesting. I, I'm unlike everyone else. Like I think Texas is tired of the you can't finish games label, you keep winning close label. I also think Iowa State's a little bit of a fraud. Who have they beat? They beat Oklahoma State before they got good. True. I think that there's a chance that that game's a blowout. I'm I'm kind of with you. I can see how it could be close, but I've got this gut feeling that Texas shows up and we'll see. I mean, this this is Quinn Ewer's legit chance to shine here. Like he is back. He, he had the little, you know, refresher last week against TCU getting back from the injury. The running situation isn't the same. Like use those big time wide receivers you have and let Quinn Ewers make plays and see what happens. And I think if Texas discovers that they, they might become even more unstoppable than they've already been this season. Yeah. And Oklahoma's a 24 point favorite, I think over BYU. So yeah. it's hard for me to see that kind of upset, especially with the books have it the way that they do in terms of what Kansas state needs um, along the lines of the chaos that they would and the help that they need. I think your best bet this week is Houston beating Oklahoma State. Yeah, and then you have to rely on TCU beating Oklahoma next weekend. So yeah, uh, especially because your 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 tiebreaker paths scenarios one was completely shredded away thanks to the Big Twelve, another one disappears if Texas wins this week. Yeah, nope that is uh, that is very true. That that situation did not play out in K-State's favor. And if you want more on that, Drew and I discussed it earlier in the week on the Wednesday show. I My thoughts on that, just to pitch in since I wasn't able to, would be to say, I think Oklahoma State getting through over Oklahoma and K-State in that three-way tiebreaker scenario is the right thing mm -hmm. because they did have those head-to-head -head wins over both the Sooners and Wildcats. The way that they are doing it is not the right way. 
in terms of, you know, interp changing the interpretation of it on November 15th. That's bull crap. And two, the, I think what bothers me the most, even more than the timing of how they are doing this, is just the behavior and the manner that they are conducting themselves in where they're refusing to take any blame or accountability for this and basically saying we're all idiots and it's all our faults for interpreting yeah. the way that we did because they had it right the entire time. Like, come on, we're not stupid. Don't treat us like it. Yeah, no, that is a uh, good way to put it. And uh, that's a good, good spot to end it in. Sunflower showdown this weekend, six o'clock kick. Cats and Lawrence trying to win the 15th straight in this series and trying to make sure that you don't get 10-year-old emotions out of a 25-year-old man, uh, that being me, after that game in Lawrence. So that will do it for Derek Young. I'm Mason Voth. Get all the content you need covering the Cats over at K-State Online. Just head over to On3, find the K-State fan site. You'll be there ready to go with plenty of coverage, not just on football, but also basketball as the Wildcats are in the Bahamas. They get things underway today. You'll be hearing this against Providence. There is a preview of the K-State Providence game up on the K-State Online YouTube page. So head over there, get up to speed on the Cats as they get ready for their MTE. So I'm Mason Voth saying thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online.